Russia is put under the microscope for the Rio Olympics. Despite a ban on the track and field team, its athletes can compete if they prove they're clean. Also on today's program, the new front line in the war on Daesh. We're looking at how they find followers online and whether authorities can keep up. And in picture this morning, the dead. Anger and sorrow in Mexico after a weekend of violence. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. It's a moment unprecedented in Olympian history. Russia has become the first country banned from track and field competitions at the Olympics for doping. It follows allegations from whistleblowers of widespread state-sanctioned use of performance-enhancing drugs. Since the allegations emerged, Russia has overhauled its anti-doping agency and pushed through reforms. Russian athletes will be able to take part at Rio under their own flag if they can prove they're clean. But will they be able to convince the rest of the world that they're competing on a level playing field? Our newsmaker today is Russia as we ask how they can get their athletes back on track. Accusations of state-sponsored doping, systemic use of performance-enhancing substances, under the watch or even facilitation of Russian officials. The International Association of Athletics Federation has banned Russia's track and field athletes and hopes that the International Olympic Committee would overturn the ban have faded. The summit uh, confirmed uh, the uh, respect and the approval and the support uh, for the decision. But there is still hope for individual athletes proven to be clean. The allegations came to light in 2014. A German documentary said Russian officials systematically accepted payment to supply banned substances and cover up tests. The state has never supported violations in sport, and this is particularly the case when it comes to doping. The state never has and never will support it. But the allegations were upheld by an independent report from the World Anti-Doping Association. Russia says it has made all the necessary reforms, but a fresh WADA report earlier this month found that the deep-seated culture of tolerance has not changed, and a strong and effective anti-doping infrastructure hasn't been created. It also detailed allegations that the Ministry of Sport was involved, all things denied by Russia. Russian athletes proven to be clean could still compete under the Russian flag in Rio, but they'll have to go through extra checks. Each athlete will have uh, to declare the eligible uh, by the respective uh, international federation uh, following an individual procedure and an individual evaluation. The IAAF has already raised concern that with doping in Russia so ingrained, even negative doping tests don't mean an athlete isn't doping. Deep-seated culture of tolerance or worse for doping that got Rusev suspended in the first place appears not to have been changed materially to date. Russia is likely to appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, saying the continued suspension is unjust and unfair, punishing all for the actions of just a few. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Austin, Texas, to discuss drugs, doping and state-sponsored cheating, in sports is John Hoberman. He's a doping expert and sports historian at the University of Texas. And in Moscow is uh, Oleg Dmitriev. He's a Russian sports commentator. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. John Hoberman, let me start with you. So the International Olympic Committee has backed the IAAF and Russia is being punished. Is all of this justified? It's entirely justified, and it is exactly what should have happened to the East Germans back in the 1970s and the 1980s. It could not happen for several reasons. One, there was no World Anti-Doping Agency. Number two, the doping policy of the IOC during that period was very passive and ineffective. And number three, 
the adequate evidence was lacking because massive evidence of the East German doping program did not appear until the early 1990s, which, by which time the East German state had collapsed. It was simply too late to exclude them from the Olympic Games. Okay, Oleg, are those comparisons with the old East Germany fair? Well, well, you know, that's a very interesting observation John is saying. And, uh, well, but uh, you have to take into consideration only one thing. If somebody uh, really wants you to bring $1,000 saying you're a bad boy, if you earn $1,000, uh, you'll bring it, you'll be a good boy. That's what exactly uh, the Russian officials, uh, track and field officials have done. And still they are trying to comply with the rules, uh, to comply to put the system into order. And uh, still the International Track and Field Association is saying no, well, that's not enough. So uh, to my mind, uh, not everything is objective and fair in this situation. You just can't punish uh, uh, doped athletes by punishing the whole country. That's the general mood in Russia okay. right now uh, on the topic. Sure, and, uh, sure. Uh, Oleg, uh, just allow way, me to Thomas come in for a second. Has just said sure, that, sure yeah. let me come in for a second. The IOC said yeah. today that individual athletes sure. cleared by the IAAF can compete under the Russian flag, so not as a team, but as individuals. They can compete under the Russian flag in Rio. Are you happy with that? And does that seem to be progress in your eyes? Uh, uh, well, uh, I am pretty happy with that. I am pretty happy with the support of uh, Thomas Bach, who uh, underlined this notion uh, in his statement uh, after the decision has been made. Uh, well, uh, in this case, uh, the, today's decision has been uh, uh, more than uh, uh, better than the Russians uh, have expected. But still, there have been some examples in the past uh, where the athletes uh, from um, other countries were doped, but uh, uh, they were individually punished, not the international right. federation. For okay. example, uh, in the U.S., sure. in the U.S., Tyson Gay, okay. uh, Tyson Gay, uh, Justin Gatlin. Okay, uh, the case is like so, that. Okay, so yes, there John. you have. So you have individuals in the United States. So John, let me put this to you then. So it's not just Oleg, it's Vladimir Putin right at the very top saying this is unjust and unfair, it's collective punishment. The Russians give examples of other athletes like Americans, as Oleg just did, who have doped in the past. Can it be, John, categorically proven that this is state-sponsored and systemic? In the case of the East Germans, we have definitive proof. In the case of the Russians, uh, there is very disturbing evidence of state-sponsored doping. Uh, there have been Russian insiders who have provided details to WADA uh, and to the press. There are the whistleblowers who ran for their lives out of Russia and are now somewhere in the United States. The key issue here is state-sponsored doping. And we know that Mr. Putin would be motivated to practice or tolerate or sponsor state-sponsored doping for the following reason. We know that Mr. Putin puts sport very high on the list of national security issues and prestige for Russia. When the Russian Winter Olympic team did very badly in Vancouver in 2010, only three gold medals, Mr. Putin was very angry. There were heads that rolled at the top, people were dismissed, and he says, you had better do better than that for Sochi 2014, and they did. 13 gold medals, twice as many total Olympic medals. And so that state-sponsored doping is always requires authorization and, and enthusiasm, uh, planning, state ambition at the top. Sure, and that is enough. what you but see having said that, that in is, certain dictatorial that is regimes. Not, that, is, that is definitely not evidence for state-sponsored doping because they can merely say for national pride they want their country to do well. They lost 3-0 to Wales in football last night. Uh, so are we to presume that Russia is going to be doping in the next football uh, tournament? Let me go to Oleg now and, and talk a little bit about whistleblowers because John mentioned whistleblowers. The Russians have opened a criminal case against whistleblower Grigory Rodchenkov um, for violating Russia's
national interests. And he's also been called, um, what he said has been called smears by a turncoat by a senior Russian official. This sounds, Oleg, like Cold War era behavior. Yeah. The type of defensive response from the Russians sounds as if they're guilty. Can you at least admit well, that? Well, uh, well, you know, I can't comment the political side of things because I think that the issue is really uh, sports like here. The yeah, man I mean, who the has man's been the former head of the anti-doping uh, lab, right? And he comes, the people, he comes out. He comes out as a whistleblower, uh, and, and, and he might have possessed. Uh, sure. He might have possessed some information on sure. uh, uh, whether uh, it was right or wrong. But uh, as far as the whistleblowers are concerned, well, first uh, we need to really investigate the evidence of what they say, and. Uh, so this is the key issue. Let the uh, all the officials, both from international uh, organizations and Russian track and field organizations, put that right. So that's the key issue here. Okay, but the man is the former head of the anti-doping lab. Wrong. Surely he would. There has been no Oleg, nationwide Oleg, the man would have. Of, the man uh, would have absolute yes. access to everything that's going on. Why, why, why the need to discredit him and, yeah. and call him a turncoat and say he's smearing and put him on, on trial? Why not maybe listen to him? Oh, well, actually, that's not up to me to decide. But on the sporting th uh, side of things, uh, the information has been leaked to the other side and not has been provided to this side. So uh, that's why the procedure of verification has to be established. As far as the Sochi Olympics are concerned, everything I've been there and everything has been uh, quite transparent regarding doping th side of things. And uh, none of uh, the athletes felt any pressure um, uh, from any of the organizations. I saw that with my own eyes. Okay, John, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this idea of the Kremlin versus the West because the U.S. Senate has questions about why WADA mishandled multiple warnings about Russia. Lots of cases. I mean, in 2012, a whistleblower came forward. WADA did nothing. There was one case of WADA actually forwarding a whistleblower's complaints back to Russia, the very people that the whistleblower was complaining about. Um, having said all of that, do you accept that the U.S. Senate getting involved in this maybe plays into the Russian narrative that it is the West versus the Kremlin? John? That is a very interesting question because there are now two cases in which the U.S. Senate has got involved in international sports. Number one was the corruption in FIFA, the International uh, Football Federation. And number two, now you have the Senate pointing out that WADA has been passive. Uh, in, in certain sense, WADA has behaved shamefully uh, and inadequately. And the reason that the U.S. government might get involved is because there is a vacuum at the top. There is no effective global authority to manage world sport or the anti-doping campaign around the world. Uh, this is, it's a peculiar situation, but who is going to do it? The Pope is not going to do it. The Secretary General of the United Nations is not going to do it. The IOC is supposed to do it, but the IOC has never had any ethical values. The only standard that counts for the IOC is the prestige of the IOC. That is why their anti-doping record uh, has been disgraceful, uh, and that is why WADA is compromised because the IOC has had so much buy-in uh, mm -hmm. into WADA. Okay. And so the irony here is that the Russians accuse the international organizations of bullying Russia, but the sad truth is that the international organizations have always been weak and ineffective on the doping front, and finally they're doing something by acting against the Russians. Okay. Sorry to rush you guys. So we just have about 30 seconds left. Oleg, I'm going to give you the final word to get a final response in before I have to wrap. Oleg? Oh, thank you very much, John, for the discussion. And I am saying that today is a good day because uh, Russian athletes are still having an opportunity to participate in an honest fight. And uh, let's, go, uh, let's hope that would be an honest competition. Okay. I'll let that be the final word. John Hoberman and Oleg Dmitriev, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Still to come in the newsmakers, screening in cyberspace, how to separate the terrorist and the sympathizer online. 
And in picture this, protests by candlelight as Mexico's teachers remember the dead. The Orlando attack on a gay nightclub was the deadliest shooting attack in recent U.S. history. The gunman, Omar Mateen, had been investigated by the FBI over pro daesh posts he made on social media. So how was he able to not only buy weapons but carry out such a horrific attack? As Sandra Gutman reports, those are the questions many in the U.S. are asking. The Orlando shooting stunned America. It was an attack that was planned online, warned about on Facebook, and perpetrated by a man who pledged allegiance to the most active terrorist group on social media, Daesh. Once again, terrorism sparked anxieties about threats to national security and cracks in intelligence. For U.S. presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, the answer is more intervention, especially online. We have to do a better job intercepting ISIS's communications, tracking and analyzing social media posts, and mapping jihadist networks, as well as promoting credible voices who can provide alternatives to radicalization. There were similar calls after the San Bernardino attacks to use technology to track and identify future criminals, especially the ones spreading dangerous ideas on the open web. Last January, U.S. officials met with Apple, Twitter, Facebook and other Silicon Valley giants to discuss ways of detecting terrorism online. One idea was an algorithm that could search for and assign people a risk value, in the same way that Facebook hunts for word combinations and patterns to detect potential suicides. But some experts say that might not work. A 2008 government study said seeking patterns in personal data cannot be easily applied to detecting and preempting a terrorist attack, and that it may not be possible at all. It also argues that it may lead to an invasion of the privacy of law-abiding citizens. The bigger problem is what to do with the data, because going after someone's ideas challenges the U.S.'s First Amendment. In a land where free speech and the ability to buy guns are fundamental rights, making statements online isn't a federal crime. It's one reason why the Orlando shooter, questioned twice by the FBI, was twice allowed to walk free. Tracking a suspect could be the easy part. Misreading intention leaves room for dangerous error. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from New York is The Intercept's Murtaza Hussein to discuss how to strike the balance between free speech and combating terrorism online through monitoring social media. Murtaza, good to talk to you again. So can we find that balance and come to some sort of framework uh, of what crosses the line and what doesn't so everybody's happy? Well, I think we can all agree that uh, statements made publicly, whether it's on social media or not, that specifically incite violence or specifically incite individuals to commit a crime is something which is worthy of scrutiny of law enforcement, and it's always been the case. I think uh, the tricky area you get into is when you start criminalizing uh, political opinions, even if those opinions may be unpopular or abhorrent. And I think that's uh, the sort of uh, the threshold that we don't want to cross because we end up violating protected uh, First Amendment speech. Mm -hmm. Now, something that's really interesting, because you talk about that sort of tricky space, uh, Omar Mateen didn't commit a federal crime in the sense that he didn't say, I'm going here to kill so many people on this particular date, at this particular hour, etc., right? It, so it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a federal crime. Uh, the timing is still questionable about some of these posts. So bearing all of that in mind, what he said on Facebook, I'm going to quote some of it. The real Muslims will never accept the filthy ways of the West. You kill innocent women and children by doing U.S. airstrikes. Now taste the Islamic State vengeance. In the next few days, you will see attacks from the Islamic State in the USA. So, in a sense, he's not actually committed a crime. He's venting and ranting, but we know he killed 49 people after that. Don't you want a system that's, that's able to nab someone who says this sort of stuff, even though he's not 
saying stuff that might be actionable and active incitement? I mean, it, it does sound kind of actionable because he's uh, implying a threat and he's uh, making a specific uh, uh, prognostication of violence. So I would say a post like that, which I believe he made on the morning of the shooting, does cross the threshold of something that's deserving of scrutiny. And from what I've seen in the past, that would invite scrutiny. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, the time horizon between that post and when he actually acted uh, was too small for anyone to do anything. But I, I do think that uh, posts would specifically mention violence or counsel violence or forecast violence are something that typically does fall under the remit of law enforcement. I think that the tricky thing in his case as well is that, yeah, he was spoken to by the FBI before, but those weren't due to social media postings. Those were due to people in his community contacting the FBI because of troubling statements he'd made. And uh, I think that what happened in those initial discussions is very interesting, but it, it does not necessarily tie back to something that social media would have caught uh, far in advance. Mm. Uh, now, Twitter and Facebook in particular have shut down Daesh accounts or Daesh supporting accounts even. They've shut down some neo-Nazi um, accounts. Um, I wonder, to what extent do you want tech companies to work in lockstep with law enforcement? Or do you want some sort of clear firewall between the two? Because they have done some good stuff in the past where they've shut down these active Daesh accounts, for example. Yeah, well, it's a, you know, it's a time, a very old uh, a dilemma between balancing civil liberties and uh, security. And I think that we're all pretty happy when we see Daesh accounts being shut down. Uh, the only problem is what if one day in the future uh, the government wages a war which is unpopular, such as the 2003 Iraq War, and it determines that a new category of accounts should be to shut down, accounts which are going against our policy on this issue. And that's why, you know, it's very, very easy to agree about Daesh, but then you wonder if a precedent has been set which in the future uh, could allow for the squelching of speech which we don't find so abhorrent. So I think that generally uh, the Daesh accounts, evidence has shown that they've been used to incite violence in the past, and that's why shutting them down has been quite uncontroversial. But I do wonder if uh, by countenancing and endorsing these actions against Daesh now, uh, one day we might not come to regret it if they target speech which we find to be more sympathetic. Okay, and finally, data mining and using algorithms to sort of scoop up keywords that people might be typing. Do you think that works or, or doesn't work? I find that to be a bit troubling because you can be branded as a terrorist uh, based on algorithm, which, you know, the veracity of that or lack thereof is very hard to determine. And I think it really opens up a Pandora's box of a minority report type situation where algorithms are branding people as criminals, putting them onto lists, and uh, subjecting them to great scrutiny, where in fact that was not warranted. So I think that you know new information technology needs new ways of uh, you know tracking potential dangers. But on the other hand, I, I do uh, does give me great pause when I see that people are being branded as uh, potential criminals based on actions which did not happen, but based on speech. And when that branding is not even happening by other people, but by happening, happening due to algorithms or uh, computer programs, and I find that to be troubling and a dangerous precedent for the future. Mm -hmm. As you say, minority report. OK, Murtaza, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much for joining us. In today's Picture This, teachers in the Mexican state of Oaxaca have been holding a vigil for the deaths of at least eight people over the weekend. They had been protesting against education reforms forced through by the state three years ago. Let's take a look.
gobierno esté negando que la policía estaba armada, tenemos la evidencia. Today's newsmaker has been Russia, as we asked what they had to do to get their athletics program back on track. The entire athletics body has been tainted by scandal. It will be hard for Russia to win back the authorities' trust. Even as the repercussions are felt from this scandal, there could be worse to come. The World Anti-Doping Agency has another ongoing investigation into doping in Russian sport. And it's warning that it may make an example of Russia if it's found to have broken even more rules. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. As always, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.